let's get right into it. On Chasing Visions, I realized that stone golems aren't found in the creep list normally, just mud, rock, and granite. It was a bit interesting to me that the developers made a new unit type on the very first level, likely to make it fit into a suitable difficulty level between that of the other types already in the game. On Departures, there's a tavern and a graveyard overlooking the internment camp so you can see with Thrall's Farsight ability. As a fun fact, I'm pretty sure this internment camp is what is later the town of Hammerfall in World of Warcraft. It would have been cool if they'd kept the mysterious inn and graveyard in WoW as a tribute to this, although Hammerfall doesn't have a bay where they could have sailed out, so it's probably not accurate in the slightest anyway. This time through, I looked more closely at the trigger on each map for comments. Though comments are peppered throughout the levels, I found this one particularly interesting. These names refer to Graham Mataraz and Michael Heiberg, who both did programming on Warcraft 3. It was interesting to see communication between the various people who worked on each level and on the game's code itself. More importantly though, I hope this can help us all realize that Blizzard isn't just some sort of single entity that gave birth to this game. It was the work of hundreds of individuals who put it together piece by piece. They even had to put things together like triggers, and this comment shows that even the resources needed to make the maps in the first place weren't all done at once. Because these levels are meant to instruct the player how to play, there were several other comments that gave feedback to the level designers in making the triggers easier or more intuitive to new players, which was kind of interesting. And here are the more notably intriguing and funny comments I found throughout the entire series. I'm not going to read them all, but you're free to pause the video now and read them if you wish. Okay, moving on. On the defense of Strongbrad, I realized that the Warcraft 3 official strategy guide differed in some points with the layout of the level. For instance, there were apparently originally some footmen fighting a bandit right here in the road who would join you after you helped them. Since the official strategy guide was made concurrently with the game so that it could be published at the time of the game's release, there were quite a few changes that were never taken out of the guide and some that show the earlier drafts of how things like dialogue were before the game's release. There are several small instances of these secrets throughout the game, but if I ever bring up a bigger one that I found in the strategy guide, this icon will appear in the corner to let you know. On Blackrock and Roll, there were already so many secret areas that I didn't look even more closely and notice these murlocs hanging out behind these trees. They're accessible in-game by cutting down the trees here and squeezing through this choke point. They don't drop anything. They're purely a secret for easter egg hunters like us to find. There are also these initials over on this hill that are only visible through the map reveal cheat. TC stands for Tim Campbell, the level designer who made this map. Also, originally the Orb of Fire gave plus 12 attack instead of plus 5. I know, right? The strategy guide seems to suggest that at one point you could control Uther as well as Arthur. He does have his own sound set. My church is the field of battle. So I wouldn't be surprised. But the level is easy enough that you definitely don't need him, and having two of the same hero with the same abilities and everything would be boring. I decided to look through the interludes a bit more closely this time around since I largely ignored them before. I didn't find too much interesting in them, but occasionally I'd find sounds that were loaded into the sound editor but never used. For example, in Jaina's meeting, there are some sounds of a hippogriff queued up. <laughs> but I can't imagine what they would have been used for. There aren't any hippogriffs or wyverns who share their sound file in Dalaran. Perhaps there was an appearance of a dragonhawk rider in the background originally? We may never know. The level that is single-handedly responsible for my first video's thousands of views is, of course, the Cult of the Damned with its strange hidden storyline of Jaina dying. I'm not entirely sure what all the sound files mean, but I did find out that originally Jaina was indeed supposed to die to give Arthas more of a motivation to kill Malganus, and she was actually going to become a banshee. This was obviously way too similar to Kerrigan turning into the Queen of Blades on StarCraft, so the role of the character turning to the undead was given to Sylvanas instead. Jaina and Arthas were also apparently more romantically involved originally. There's a great easter egg in March of the Scourge in the bottom right corner of Hearthglen. This building here isn't a doodad like the others, it's a destructible unit. Once you knock it down, open the crate by the wall. Inside the crate is a sheep, and inside the sheep is a potion of restoration. It's secrets like these that make me doubt that I'll ever catch every easter egg. That is some sneaky work to hide that item. The culling has a couple of unused triggers and sound effects that I found soon after I finished the first easter egg video, and was one of the first signs that I hadn't been a careful enough easter egg hunter my first time through. Originally, the developer of this map, David Freed, had men, women, and children come out of the buildings when he destroyed them, saying things like, The roof is collapsing! Run! Ah, screw it. I'm too lazy to use talking portraits anymore. Sorry, you'll have to settle for just interface <laughs> icons. What did we ever do to you? You're supposed to be the defender of Lordaeron. <laughs> the King's own men are attacking! Run for your lives! The walls are falling in! Get out! Mercy, my lord. 
This was deemed as disturbing and going too far with Arthas' slaughter, so eventually a compromise was reached where women and men would come out, but no plagued children, and the sounds were done away with entirely. As a fun fact on this map, originally the villagers who came out of the buildings were hostile to the player, but they were changed to neutral so that you had to physically make the decision to either wait for them to turn to zombies and kill them, or to slaughter the townsfolk before they could change. Obviously the latter option is more tactically advantageous, but it gets a feel for how Arthas feels slaughtering his own people to save them. Unless you find it fun to kill the villagers throughout the preceding levels anyway. On Dissension, I completely overlooked the very first instance of the game's first Pandaren easter egg. One is hiding in the trees right after you fight the blue dragons near the center of the map. It drops a pendant of mana for you and dooms the future of Warcraft to silliness. The Goblin Laboratory on this level is also, unlike normal neutral buildings, destructible. Well, technically. Lastly, I'm not sure if anyone else finds this trigger interesting, but on the last level, the way they make Malganus invincible until you obtain Frostmourne is by simply giving him onks of reincarnation every time he dies if you don't have the sword yet. This can sometimes lead to a bug where a bunch of onks of reincarnation spawn around Malganus. On Digging Up the Dead, there's a mysterious sheep perched on this cliff here who belongs to Tychondrius' team. It doesn't drop anything when killed, so it's likely either a joke or an accidental placing of a critter while the wrong team was selected on the editor. David Freed made this level, and it's clear that he liked to hide secrets and names of characters. In this case, the three paladins were named after real people. Edward King was a Warcraft 3 quality assurance analyst, Nicholas Buzan is named after one of David's friends, and Gregory Edmondson is named after his girlfriend's stepfather. The villagers also have specific names, which likely had significance. I and Kenshin are clearly from animes. Also, there's one unused dialogue line from Tychondrius. Where are the necromancer's remains? Retrieve them immediately. This resembles some of the unused lines on the founding of Duratar concerning an original time limit mechanic. The map's current state doesn't allow Arthas to dilly-dally, really, so maybe originally this initial march to Kel'Thuzad's tomb was laid out differently. On Into the Realm Eternal, there's a cave in the southwest corner of the map. It's inaccessible and completely abandoned, so I'm guessing maybe it's an unused creep location. Where is the entrance to your land, elf? That's not an elf. You can't use the same model as both an elf prisoner and a human letting Kale and his elves know all the humans are being recalled from the front lines. Use an elven priest model, for heaven's sake. I knew that on the fall of Silvermoon you could use banshees to possess the elven workers and build up your own human base. However, I didn't realize that there was a specific missing safeguard that could make this approach really overpowered. Normal melee maps limit the number of the heroes you can train, but since that trigger isn't run on this map, you can train as many human heroes from an altar of kings as you want, so long as you build up a human castle and have enough resources. This can make for a very odd but effective approach to wiping out Silvermoon. On Black Rock and Roll 2, I overlooked a sneaky murloc nightcrawler hiding behind these trees near the North River Bridge. If you clear the trees and kill it, it'll drop you a mana stone. We have many secrets. No, no, you don't, Kieran Tormage. You really don't. Sorry. The first level, Landfall, has a couple of unused lines of dialogue. There seem to be a lot of these, so I'm just going to call them ULDs from now on. Probably should have done that a long time ago. The lines are from Grunts, and one of them was deleted and is unplayable. Dang it. But the other says, Pillage the town! Burn it to the ground! This sound file, along with some unused custom elven units in the editor, suggests that a high elven town or camp was originally encountered as a target on this level, complete with elven archers, swordsmen, and Dalaran guard towers. There's also originally a map-specific Torin unit, presumably as part of the final fight against the centaur, a Torin war priest who had command aura and heal. I also never noticed that the Torin that you join in the camp are Torin youngbloods. They're slightly smaller and have a fraction of the hit points of a normal Torin, probably to make the fight a bit harder for you. Still nothing too interesting on the long march, except that originally Karen and his Torn would turn on you if you attacked him, but now he just takes it with bull-headed silence. I thought it was weird on the wreckage of Lordaeron interlude that Tychondrius says that the orcs are all gone. There are clearly some wayward clans that didn't follow through all, the demon gate of which was used to communicate with Archimonde in the first place. I'm not sure if this is a mistake, a rewriting, or simply Tychondrius making a generalization to, or manipulating Manoroth. Also, there was some fiddling around with the Red Dragon unit files in this map. I wonder if the demon's strength was originally going to be demonstrated against dragons in an earlier draft of this interlude. Let's see, nothing on Cry of the War Song, nothing on Spirits of Ashenvale, except the peons are programmed to attack trees a little bit faster than normal, nothing on the Blood of Manoroth interlude, nothing on the Hundred of Shadows... Ah! There's an interesting secret hidden in the map files for Were Wyverns Dare. 
The Orc Warlock unit, which isn't used in this map by the way, has its tooltip changed to level designed by Deltry. This is the nickname of developer Dave Hale. I'm not surprised that the Oracle doesn't have any more. I picked that one apart for hours. The strategy guide makes a funny error, though. It calls this crown of kings a crown of command. Looks like the writer had my favorite board game on his mind when he made that error. But there is one unused unit on By Demons Be Driven, a troll witch doctor named Mil Jansa. He had the sleep ability swapped out for the sentry ward ability, but besides that and different coloring, he wasn't any different from a normal witch doctor. I have no idea what his original purpose was, but if I had a guess, I'd speculate that he was just some sort of narrator NPC who told you about the purging process for curing Grom or something. Kind of like how Senjin knew how to purge the corrupted fountain on the demo campaign. We'll probably never know, though. Also, I normally wouldn't showcase a fan-made campaign, but I think it's notable that in Razorclaw X's Wanderers of Sorceria, the same randomizer is used for the Magic Vault in Book 2, Level 2. The campaign even qualifies it as an achievement called Relic of a Lost Campaign, so clearly I wasn't the first to find this secret. Razorclaw X, wherever you are, I salute you for helping this Easter egg live on as the trigger comment hoped it would. Let's talk about Chandra's Feathermoon for a moment. She's kind of an oddity in the game. In the first level, she's depicted as just another archer, but by the second level, she has her own ranger model, similar to Sylvanas's, without the hero glow. I originally figured that this meant she had just been promoted or had gotten a more significant leadership position among the Sentinels, but look, in Enemies at the Gate's map file, she's her ranger model. A weird trigger changes her into an archer before the cinematic starts, which is why you see her like this. I cannot for the life of me figure out the reason for this. It's a very weird trigger. Why couldn't she just be her original model in level 1, even just for the cinematic? This is definitely one of the more baffling easter eggs in the game, so far as I'm concerned. In Daughters of the Moon, I never noticed that there's a shortcut along the east side of the undead camp. Simply knock down these trees by the fountain, and there's a clearly cut path down to the Night Elf village. A handy secret for anyone attempting Warcraft 3 speedrun. In the Awakening of Storm Rage, there's a broken ULD called Whelp Dragon 24, which is probably a remnant of the scrapped Tharifoss quest I mentioned. Clearly the quest had something to do with Tharifoss and some green dragon whelps. Taronda also has 10 ULDs that are broken sound files. I really wish we could know what she said. They are probably related to the Tharifoss quest as well. If any more Warcraft 3 developers are watching, let me know if you can make all the original dialogue files public, please. I'll pay you. Brothers in Blood is another level that was so chock full of secrets I ended too early thinking I'd found them all. There's an awesome secret found if Furion keeps going after killing the sludge monstrosity. Go to the edge of the river and cast Force of Nature on the mushrooms on the other side. The treants can move on into a cave full of furbolgs that will join you. They can use this waygate to teleport back to Furion's area of the cavern. Having their forces on your side is honestly a bit overkill for how easy this scenario is, but I was really impressed with this easter egg. Also, the biggest panda ever has an encounter similar to the Infernal in the Terror of the Tides campaign. Depending on who encounters it first, different things are said. One shot, one kill. Come and get it. <laughs> How about if I just stand over here? Do! Elun, give me strength. Our sins have returned to haunt us. I think Furion's in particular is interesting if you think about his line's implications too hard, but obviously whatever sins the Night Elves did to incur the wrath of pandas is non-canonical. I hope. Also, there were originally some frost traps that came out of these statues. This is how they worked. They only did 10 damage, which is pretty lame. It's just as well they took them out of the game if they were that insignificant of a threat. I wish we knew more about the Watcher faction. Maiev is an interesting character, but I'd like to know more about these talking owl bears who work for them and this Keeper of the Grove. I was hoping to find something more in Illidan's level, but still basically nothing. There is an unused interface icon for the item version of the Skull of Gul'dan, and considering how big the Skull of Gul'dan is on cinematics and Blizzard art, I really don't get what this thing is supposed to be. Gul'dan was not a giant, so I've always assumed that this was supposed to be all symbolic for some reason. In reality, the original plan was to have Illidan find and pick up the Skull of Gul'dan and then bring it to some place to perform the ritual of consuming its power, but it was simplified greatly in the level we play today. Also, here's a fun fact. Chris Metzen originally conceived Illidan as a satyr in the storyline. It makes sense when you think about how satyrs are night elves corrupted by fell magic, but the writers for Warcraft didn't like it as it sounded too Pan from Shakespeare-esque, so Illidan was changed to his current demon hunter form. In in my opinion, a wise move for sure. There's a ULD on the last Guardian interlude by a Night Elf of some kind, but no idea what it was. And finally, on Twilight of the Gods, I overlooked this stone token hidden in a tree path behind these furball huts. I should have known the devs wouldn't have skimped on easter eggs on the last level. There are also three unused units in the campaign's files that have an amusing purpose. Before I give away what they are and do, watch this cutscene. 
At least now, we are free. If you listen closely, you can hear the sound of a child dying. That's right, the target points for Thrall's chain lightning on Archimonde are invisible units named, you guessed it, Little Timmy. The actual chain lightning bouncing off Archimonde's shoulders or whatever is a clever cinematic trick, but you'd think the map maker would have at least covered his bases by changing the model to something that didn't make a sound when it died. According to an episode of Blizzard's official podcast, Blizzcast, there actually used to be another level after this one. Most people don't know there was actually a level that was going to come after Night Elf 7, where um, it ended up being almost a two-hour mission. And the more we played it, the more we realized that you got done with this, this mission where you don't want to go into this big slugfest of a mission. So rather than keep it, we actually cut the last mission for the game and then peeled back and made Night Elf 7 the final mission. The strategy guide calls this level Archimonde's Ascent, so perhaps the name Twilight of the Gods was originally given to a level involving positioning the wisps or otherwise setting up the trap for Archimonde yourself. Like Rob Pardo said in the clip, though, that would have obviously just been too much. Whew, I missed more secrets than I thought. I need to take a break. This episode's going to have to be...